And thank you to all the members of the uh, Cyber Futures Dialogue that took time out of your lives to meet with us here. Uh, my name is Brian Hurd. I've been in the community about 30 years. Uh, founded the Navy Cyber Counter Espionage Program at NCIS, uh, and also was the chief of US watch listings identity layer before I took the job as Microsoft chief of cybercrime intelligence. I now work for the global insurance company Aon, uh, helping clients around the world before, during, and after breaches. And I have the least impressive resume of everybody on my panel. So we're here to talk about the role of the insurance industry in times of global conflict. And as we get started, I'll do a quick scene setter and then I'll do quick introductions for our team. We have uh, Simon Pope, who uh, we work together at Microsoft. He ran a lot of their incident response programs and now is a CISO of a, a major manufacturing corporation for home entertainment. Uh, we have uh, uh, Fabian Willy, who is from Swiss Re and runs their overall European and cyber operations. And then we have Andrea Bonhomblanc, who has been a CISO extraordinaire, well, <laughs> executive extraordinaire in many corporations and advises companies around the world in, in some of the issues we're gonna talk about today. One of the scene setters that in preparing for the panel, we did a couple calls is the insurance industry in times of conflict, in times of peace, always calls back to enterprise risk management. And Maurice, in the first uh, session, talked about how we start in the cyber context, but it truly is enterprise risk management that all the waves go through, whether it is the birth of electricity, flight, the internet, or AI, or machine learning, or quantum computing. All of these, while absolutely world-changing, are not world changing to agencies that have been through world wars. And providing property insurance during a war is quite an endeavor, I'll tell you. The context of this is that in the insurance industry, around all the global incidents, and the slides that we used in prep for this will be shared out uh, on the post in a few minutes, was the root cause analytics of all of those different events all around the world devolve into a dirty dozen, 12 specific behaviors or controls that would have stopped the spark or spread. And we are facing a tsunami of ransomware. It is up 1,100% since the peg point in 2019. We are seeing it hit every part of our lives, our hospitals, our cities, our companies. But throughout all those waves, and I'll, I'll turn to the panel for, for questions about it, the risk management and the distilling of that information into behaviors back to these companies also often precedes by a year or two the regulators calling for the very same behaviors that the insurance underwriters asked you about two years ago. So with that context, I'll start with, with a question to Swiss Re about in the context of cyber and the trends we're seeing and the birth of AI, what do you see as some of the initial areas companies can focus on for resilience over time and in time of conflict? Yeah, thanks, uh, Brian, for the introduction. Um, so my job is basically to understand companies and individuals in terms of the cyber risks they, they bring with. And, uh, and equip them with insurance thereafter, right? And I think uh, uh, cyber insurance has started more than a decade ago as a small little plant, and, and we are now in a totally different environment. We are in a totally different world, and, and I think the overarching theme here is really the, the global conflicts we face, right? And, and I think a key question we deal, need to deal with as an industry is, how we manage to understand the risks of those companies, right, to still be able to equip them with, with, with insurance, right? And, uh, and how we think about it is, is, is really basically, um, we learn from, from the losses we see, right? And, and in our pre-discussions, we have been a lot discussing about the ransomware trend, which we have been observing over the last two, three years, right? When cyber insurance started many years ago, there were basically only big data breaches around, uh, 
but sort of the ransomware, uh, the extortion element of, of cyber was, was unknown to, to everyone, right? This has massively changed, obviously, right? This, this huge surge and wave of ransomware claims has, has, has been shaking the industry, uh, including our industry, and we needed to learn from that, right? And how we did it is basically we analyzed the, the loss patterns, and we would actually conclude what are the cybersecurity controls we deem to be important to have in place to defend against such such trends, right? And, uh, and when we do underwriting uh, these days, we have basically uh, a long list of, of cybersecurity controls and, and elements in place we want to see uh, uh, from the insurance, right? Because the world has changed uh, in a way that uh, high cyber hygiene and, and very strong cybersecurity um, has become a prerequisite um, for uh, getting access to cyber insurance. And I think that's exactly where we can play an important role as an industry in the sense that we promote those, um, you know, the dirty dozens, you call it, Brian, <laughs> those very important basic cyber hygiene measures, right? And work such as a, I would call it, catalyst to, to, to the society and economy uh, to embrace those controls and, 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 and get to a better future, right? I think this is very important and, and I think we can play there an important role as well. Thank you. And Andrea, when you are, looking at the inputs to the advisory, to the books and articles you've written, to the, to the companies you're advising who are trying to plot a path years out that is stable for not only economic change but global political conflict, what are some of the inputs you're seeing and then how do you translate that into a strategic ability for executives to make decisions above the technical layers? That's an easy question. <laughs> not really. <laughs> easy question, um, not an easy answer. No, no, Over to not you. an easy question. <laughs> um, so let me provide a little bit of a framework. So he said CISO extraordinary. Nothing like that. I did ask, be asked to be the CISO of a comp my last company where I served as a, a corporate executive and I was in charge of risk, audit, and corporate responsibility. And they said, here's cybersecurity, figure it out. So I became the CISO extraordinaire for that moment. For about six to 10 months, I spent time understanding what the InfoSec people were doing, mm -hmm. which was very difficult for me because my background is a lawyer, general counsel, chief risk officer. And so, um, but it was a really good exercise because it took me to the place of what does management need to know and what does the board need, need to know? And so uh, put it in the context of enterprise risk management generally, mm -hmm. Um, and what are those inputs? So I think every company, uh, every organization has to start with what is the situational awareness of the most important risks that are in the marketplace and in the world. And I like starting actually with the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report that comes out every year, it just came out a week ago, um, where they identify the really big global strategic risks in five different categories, economic, environmental, societal, geopolitical, and technological. And for all the years that they've been publishing this, 19 years they've been publishing this global risk report, technology was always kind of in the, you know, in the lower part of the range of uh, global risk. Cybersecurity had risen to a certain extent. This year, uh, very, very dramatically, and finally, in my opinion, they have put, um, they have a one year, a two year, and a 10 year outlook. For one year, they've put artificial intelligence driven disinformation and misinformation as the number two risk for 2024, and as the number one risk for the two year outlook, and the number five or six risk for the 10 year outlook. And cybersecurity is the number four, number five current, and two years. And it's also in the long-term tenure and the top 10. And then there's another one, is, which is adverse outcomes of AI is in the tenure outcome, like number six or number seven. So for me, this is a really important part where you start as an enterprise risk management person, as management, and as the board to start seeing the scenery. But then you have to translate it down into what is your footprint as a company, what is your strategic plan? And so the building of resilience around those things is to me critical and it starts with that understanding. Thank you. Now Simon, you've uh, had an interesting transition in a very long and storied career from 
running events for a lot of homes and, and companies at Microsoft and now being the CISO homeowner of one. So in the context of both helping people around the globe and also now having the role of being the CISO, what context in those two roles do you think in terms of kind of what we're looking at for the, the insight from the underwriters and the path ahead? Well, um, <laughs> See, that's not the question you told me to ask you, I, I know. You'd okay. you get bored question. if I did that. <laughs> um, I really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just be honest here. I'm always honest, like probably to my detriment. Uh, I hate the term CISO. It feels like it describes something we did 10 years ago and finally now everyone needs a CISO, except we don't, we need, in my opinion, um, digital trust offices. And it's about creating, maintaining, and protecting the trust. The trust with our employees, the trust with our customers, the trust with regulators, the trust with our industry partners, right? And so it's all about the trust. It's not about defending against security, it's about maintaining trust. And the way which you, one of the ways in which you can erode that trust is to have a security event uh, which leads to um, some violation of that trust through the exposure or leakage of information or manipulation of in information. So one of the hard things I think in, with companies and with CISOs is we're put in boxes and expected just secure infrastructure and maybe just secure product, if we've got that role, I have both. Um, and really we're locked out of conversations to do with where does the business want to go? Where does it see its biggest risks, risks and opportunities? How is digital trust, privacy, security, risk compliance, part of that conversation? And how do we then advise the company? How do we build? We, we talk about people, process, technology. I tend to think of it as, I agree with the process, I tend to think of it as culture, process, and technology. How do we create the culture in our company? It's not just a security where culture. It's how do we think about um, making trust and transparency about process and about what we do. How do we get that right for our company? Uh, given, given, our, uh, given it is what, what else we do, and it's going to be a different mix for every company. Um, how do we build those pro processes, not just to actually protect, um, but to ensure we have resilience so that we can recover in particular response? How do we automate that? How do we build that? Um, and with respect to insurance, you talked about the dirty dozen, and there's, uh, we tend to over-concentrate on those. Uh, and what I mean by that is, at the board level, talking to the audit committee, for example, we'll talk about these, the dirty dozen, which are 12, well, in my view, 11 important things that we should actually be focused on. There's one I won't get into now. Um, but that misses the big picture. And the big picture is, where does the company want to go? Where are its big business risks? How is, call it security, privacy, compliance, risk management, how is that part of the conversation? Because that should be informing what we do, also with respect to what, what we want to, uh, what risks we can and want to offload with insurance. Right. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that as in my company, we're not doing it in most companies, so it has it. Uh, and I think, I think the point you raise goes into the second phase of, of the discussion we've had. We talked about the global rise in ransomware and kind of that insight at the strategic level. Now I'm gonna drill down one level into kind of the, the underwriting, frame, uh, underwriting questions and frameworks we sometimes use. The dirty dozen and, and the top root causes, as you've indicated, are the start of the journey where other people declare they have finished the marathon at the starting line. And we're like, no, that was the, uh, oh, okay, we'll talk later. It is, you're on mile marker 0 0.01, not 26 point, or 25, 26.1. And uh, the issue is what we're seeing at that board level, when you take that context, as, as Maurice and others have said, and, and Sunil in the previous thing, when you take the overall board context and you look at your cyber, your criminal policies, your property, your E&O, your directors and officers, a common topic that will come up again about liability and due diligence for those of you legal eagles in the audience. Those frameworks and those questions are born out of all of the cyber house fires and calamities around the world and do bring that strategic context. 
but often when it lands on the board, it lands as a budget request with the dirty dozen used to merely justify better backups or MFA, and you've all been through that this year. How do you, in your role advising companies, how do you, and this is an important distinction, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on the pulpit for a split second. How do you level up or distill up the discussion as a fine spirit to executives, not dumb it down or water it down because these executives don't understand cyber? And for those of us in the room who are cyber, if you haven't read a 10K report and don't know how to, don't explain to the rest of the board, they don't understand cyber. So how do you translate what is a continent of information and level it up so the board can make strategic decisions within that context? Well, I've said this before and I'll say it again, and I think it really starts with the board transforming itself into the right group of people. And I think boards are very much uh, 20th century, I was gonna say 19th century, 20th century, and they have to uh, level up themselves to a 21st century attitude, and not just today, but thinking about 2050 and thinking about the future. And so we need to have people on boards that have the technology, the digital uh, experience and expertise, uh, who are thinking about the future, not just the past, who are a little younger and a little more diverse because they're much more in touch with some of these issues. And so I think one of the biggest uh, problems and challenges we have in companies is not having the right people on the board. And I'm not one of those people who says, oh, we have to have a CISO on every board, or, you know, you don't, I, don't, I know you don't like the term, but we do need to have digital uh, business and technology experts on the board, people who are business savvy. So they're gonna be the ones who start asking the right questions, demanding the right information of the CISO and the chief risk officer. And I think it also translates into having the right talent in that pool. Uh, the chief risk officer who is not just the old fashioned chief risk officer who looks backwards and gives a snapshot and a you know, torrent of information. But this, the chief risk officer is working closely in an integrated manner with the chief security, digital, other people and then collects the information that they know is relevant to management and that they know is relevant to the board. And Simon, I'll come to you and I'll finish even with a discussion to use. Simon, in your experience, either being in a boardroom advising them on an incident or preparing for your own boardroom in this or other jobs, what do you find as the chief treasury officer sometimes, which insurance falls under, or the chief risk officer in general counsel, how do you bridge the gap at the executive level? I'm not sure I've got a good solution to that. I think bridging the gap can be very challenging if you don't have somebody, if you don't have technologists on the board, if you don't have technologists, oh sorry, if you don't have people that are used to thinking in terms of risk and managing risk on the board, if they're always only focused on just the pure business aspects, I think it's a very hard conversation. And to Andrea's point, I think they need to up-level themselves. I mean, I've, I've done work on that. Um, I, I, at other places I've been, they have done that work and they have leveled themselves up and they ask the right questions and I think it's very easy because their job is to ask the right questions. And I've also had experiences with not the right boards where I'm just, I'm almost trying to teach them and presenting slides hoping that they will ask the right question almost, but not quite printing it on the slide. The question you should ask me is, <laughs> So I can actually give them the answer and we can have the discussion around something they need to have a discussion around. But that doesn't often happen. So uh, I think it is just challenging. I don't have a great answer. Uh, but a great appreciation of the problem and that's why we're here. Um, believe me, I, and for all of us, a consultant that tells me they have the answer is not the consultant I hire. Because <laughs> there, there is not an answer. I'm looking for somebody with scars and an opinion. So for... I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the insurance insights and frameworks. So one of the things that I think is, is a trend is that you see questions this year from underwriters that need to come across the board, and then two or three years later, it'll show up as the SEC or FTC standard. But CISOs don't look at them, and executives, even chief risk officers. The newest questions are the newest way somebody burnt down their house. That question got there because we've written hundreds of millions of dollars in checks 
because somebody learned a new way to deep fat fry a turkey, cyber speaking, in their own living room. So as you see the relationship of trying to message that to a board, does it get stuck with the chief risk officer? Does it get stuck with the general counsel? Do you get to interact with the CISO, or are they often the victim of the questionnaire? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the famous insurance questionnaires, right, which can be a, a blessing, but sometimes also a big headache to a lot of companies. And, uh, and they, they evolved quite a bit over time. I remember, you know, when it was all about, you know, who had the, the shortest questionnaire in the industry, right? And that went down to four questions. And, and believe me, this is no way uh, in, in understanding a risk, you know, how, how we want to understand it and quantify it, right? But there was a time where awareness for cyber was very low throughout the companies, uh, in the boards. Uh, this has changed dramatically. We heard it. Uh, it's, it's number one risk globally. And, and that changed mentality and also sort of demand for cyber insurance. Um, and, and, and hence those questionnaires, they, they changed uh, its, its depth. Uh, they are becoming quite lengthy these days, yeah. right? There's a standard questionnaire, there's an add-on for ransomware coverage. Um, and, and I think the, the most important thing is uh, they started to be very technical at the time, right? And I, I'd like to make here a case for maybe not the biggest companies. You know, we have a lot of very uh, experienced people in the room, CISOs from larger companies, right? But if you think about the cyber future and, and if we think about cyber res resilience and we really mean it, right, then we need to think about the smaller companies as well, the SMEs, uh, the mid-market companies of this, this world, right? And they might not even have a CISO, right? And they might not even have a board because the CEO is, 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 is the board as well, right? And there the challenge starts because if you think about our host country today, more than 95% of the population of the Swiss companies are in the SME segment, really mom and pop shops around the corner, right? And if you want to achieve cyber resilience, we also need to think about those people and those companies, right? And again, back to the questionnaires, would they understand the very technical questions we, we ask them? No, they don't. So first of all, we need to find a language which, yeah. which they understand. And this goes through all the ranks, all the hierarchies of a company, right? And we all need to progress and, and, and somehow train ourselves to, to understand this new discipline, right? And that's why, again, I think, um, um, I see this very much as a, as a joint effort, right? I'd like to call it something like team sports, cybersecurity, cyber insurance needs to go hand in hand, right? And if you can make um, risk assessment something which resonates with people as well, right? And this is not to finger point on somebody and say, hey, I have assessed you, self-declaration based on a questionnaire. By the way, also ran an outside in risk scan, right? Here are the vulnerabilities and you are in very bad shape, right? That was the discussion a few years ago. Today's discussion is a different one, is that we would also offer recommendations how you fix the problem, how you Absolutely. deal with the issue. If right? that's not part of your insurance process because now, you need to talk to a better insurance company you're not a or broker. Yeah. I'm gonna, so wait one second. I have to, in respect for everybody's time, and because I know all three of you want to opine on the following, I'm going to start and we're going to come down the line. Uh, 60 seconds, we're closing out on your thoughts on AI as it comes into the, the insurance industry and as it comes into the executive level. So we, we each get one minute to finish. Over to All you. Right. Um, so I make a, a big statement here. I think um, we as an insurance industry, we don't have any clue about the consequences of AI as we speak, right? It might be a big opportunity, but it also might be a big threat, right? Um, it reminds me very much on, on how we thought about uh, cloud, uh, cloud services, cloud infrastructure in the beginning. You know, it was like a bad thing because it can lead to huge accumulation risk, systemic risk, you know, just by hitting one cloud and affecting many companies. But it also can improve cybersecurity, again, right, because those clouds are defended in a much better way than many companies out there, right? And the same thought process we need to understand for AI. What does it really mean? How does it change the risk nature of, of companies out there? And we learn, we're going to learn from, from losses we see in the industry. We're going to dissect them. We look at what are the drivers. And hopefully we come up with, with helpful controls, with helpful cyber hygiene measures, right, to make this as well an insurable risk. Because the worst thing we could do is say, hey, AI is excluded from cyber insurance, right? That's not what I want to do. So. I'm going to take a slightly different take on it, one that's a little more technical um, with respect to um, what happens during a security incident. I, like we've seen AI penetrate, and not just generative AI, but 
more traditional, just still black box um, neural network based type AI or neural network equivalent. Uh, we've seen that penetrate many, many different uh, markets and used in many different ways. And uh, you know, it's inside our cameras and we don't even think about it. We're going to see now, especially now when we, we have generative AI being able to do such amazing things with language models, we're going to see something, I'm not sure when, uh, similarly happen with respect to how generative AI controls the operations of uh, cyber attacks. So ransomware is merely the actions on objective, how they actually monetize, uh, you know, force the company, hold, hold the company uh, by the throat and say, give us your money. Um, but how they get to that point of being able to hold the company hostage, um, it, it, that's a, a campaign against a particular company or a number of companies. We've seen with cybercrime, I'm going a little all over the place here, bear with me. We've seen how cybercrime organizations um, build tools and have ransomware as a service, remote access toolkits as a service. Um, it's, it's, it's a burgeoning, vibrant ecosystem that really enables the criminals and nation states to participate in that ecosystem. We're going to see AI tools. We're going to see generative AI tools at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, that allow companies, allow attackers to move very, very fast inside company networks to exploit as much of the infrastructure as possible for their benefit, and then to perform exfiltration of that data, not just ransomware of it, but exfiltration of the data, knowing what data is most valuable to the company or most valuable to the attackers to extract. And so we're going to see a, a vastly increased tempo at some stage with how attacks unfold inside companies. It means that a small outfit will be able to take, undertake a large-scale attack that, say, a nation state like a a nation state um, group like an APT28 or APT29 might undertake. Uh, and we're going to see this ordinary criminals be able to do this with relatively junior operators. And that's going to change things dramatically. And I don't, I think it's inevitable then the defense is going to have to adopt those same high level techniques to orchestrate the defense of those systems and how, and how we respond. And we'll be at a different level of um, cybersecurity uh, response than we've ever seen before. And that's going to affect insurance. I'm not exactly sure how. Well, well, Andrea, after you. Okay, so I just want to pan out even further to the higher picture um, because both of these uh, comments have been spot on. But I think if we want to translate this into the ordinary manager, C-suite, board person, um, what they have to think about is insurance. First of all, I think insurance is at the forefront and should be at the forefront of helping all of us understand this stuff and incentivizing companies to do the right thing. So there has to be that push-pull that takes place and that helps also the people who are in charge of these various uh, responsibilities. But I think that the mindset that we all have to take right now is to understand that Gen AI is the canary in the coal mine of exponential technologies that are coming at us. And that is going to be the, the rest of our lives Quantum is coming down the pike. There's all kinds of other good, good and bad things. Uh, to your point, there's both opportunity and risk. And as opposed to cybersecurity, it's all, all about uh, defending from the bad, right? But in the case of AI and synthetic biology and quantum, there's going to be all about the amazing opportunities that we have never seen before. But there will be the amazing asymmetric power that these little criminal gangs will have against all of us. And so I think we all have to have that futuristic mindset. I'm actually, I'll, I'll plug a book that I'm starting to write right now. It will be available hopefully in two years. But it's about governing exponential technology and how boards and executives and leaders have to think about this as a ongoing set of battles and opportunities. If you use AI, you could write it in two days, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so to finish the thought, and, and, and that's why we assembled a panel to talk about the various layers, but what I'll close with is closing thoughts about, about not only cybersecurity but AI. And, and I think, uh, Fabian, you, you talked about it very well, is we have seen, we have insurance policies for nuclear reactors. We have insurance policies for fleets of low orbital satellites. We, there is a way, although, and I agree, the, the insurance industry admits we haven't figured out AI, but we can insure AI when used in HR, and there are AI bias audits. The insurance industry learns via loss, and what used to be silent cyber is now silent AI. <laughs> we will measure it. We will watch it succeed. We will watch it fail. 
and we will bring those questions to you in the very forms you will complain about and ignore. <laughs> so my parting thought about this is no matter who you're dealing with, there is a secret level of intelligence buried in every insurance form because we're willing to write a check when it blows up. If you think insurance isn't worth it, you care about those questions twice as much as if you're actually gonna get insurance because you're your own insurance company. So even if you're not gonna get insurance, the insight and secret intelligence you'll get by interacting with our community helps set paths, helps bring ambiguity to some type of concreteness. In times of conflict as well, the, these types of things we need with this drastic a change facing all of us, stability and process of risk management for every wave that comes at us, no matter how wonderfully game-changing it might be, it does have to come back to executives distilling that up into something that they and boards can lead companies, can lead countries. And assembling this group and your feedback, and thank you for joining the panel, and Val, as always, honored to be a part of the team, all of us. Uh, thank you for our opportunity to talk about one small insight, one small part of an overall risk equation. Thanks.